Stephanie Boozer with CUGC HQ, and I'd like to welcome you to today's user share. We're going to be talking about Windows 10 on Zen Desktop, and this is just part one of a series. I'd like to let you know that our presentation will include live Q&A today. We'd like you to use the question area in the GoToWebinar control panel to type in your questions, and our moderator will keep an eye on those and ask those during the presentation. Also want to let you know that this presentation is being recorded and will be available on mycugc.org shortly afterwards. Our moderator today is CTP Andrew Wood. He is a member of the UK CUGC Group Steering Committee and would like to let Andrew come on and tell you a little about himself and introduce our presenter. Ah, thanks very much, Stephanie. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, if you're in that particular part of the world, or happy lunchtime. Uh, depending on, on, on where it is that you are. Happy New Year, if I've not spoken to you before. I think we could probably get away with that for another couple of days. As Stephanie says, my name's Andrew Wood. I'm a Citrix Technology Professional and help organise the UK uh, Citrix User Group meetings, uh, which we won an award for. Um, thanks very much to the MyCUG site for uh, giving us that, for organising the events that we do in the UK. We have four events a year. Next one will be April. For any of those interested in coming along either as a visitor or as a speaker. Now during those sessions uh, we have a number of people who contribute and last year, James, I think James you managed all four, to present at all four on various um, topics around uh, the deployments that James had been working on on Windows 10. Uh, I found them very interesting. So you may know James as a uh, soon to be renamed Absence Bigot. He's a CTA, a Citrix Technology Advocate, and a member of the CUGC community. Uh, I do know a number of you have said before, it's great to have one person from the northeast of England speaking, but when, when can we have two? And today is that day. Um, James, would you like to add anything? Um. No, not really. Um, just thank you very much. Um, it's very um, nice to be asked to uh, do one of these webinars. So um, thank you for having me. Cool. Uh, we've already got a question. So I'm going to try and interrupt you as we go on. Um, Phil's asking how many parts are expected in this series. I know you've done at least four for this as a group. So this is part one. Um, other, other parts will follow, I'm sure, yes? Yeah, it depends how kind of really detailed you want to get with a specific area. I think I did an entire presentation up in Edinburgh, literally just on file type associations on Windows 10, which is um, bizarrely enough that you can get a 45-minute presentation out of that. So, yeah, um, I was aiming for about two, possibly three, really. There we go. All right, then, Phil, I hope that answers your question. And by all means, you can contact James directly on Apps and Spirit. James, I'll let you, um, I'll let you crack on. Okay, uh, hopefully you can uh, see my screen, okay, and I um, shall now just make sure I've actually got my screens the right way around, which I haven't, of course, naturally, so let's just That's swap right. those it's, around. Uh, hopefully that all looks good now. I can see your note screen now. Can you? Yes. I, I'm not saying right. that. Is that oh, That's better. That's better. Seamless. We'll get that in post. No, that's Don't worry bizarre. about me. Away you go. That's very, that's very bizarre, because... It was the other way around. Oh, right. Um, now it's gone. Now it's gone, much. now it's gone back to notes. But so whatever you did. Now it's gone back to notes. Yes. What? There we. There we go. How's that? Brilliant. Seeing. That's where I was. Originally. No one will notice. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, brilliant. Anyway, well, it wouldn't be a proper sort of user group thing without some odd technical issues. Anyway. Uh, well, thank you for for people for coming. To me, as I said, uh, quite a few bits Windows 10 based presentation the last year. I also did at Bry Forum as well, um, which is why you'll probably notice that this particular presentation has a bit of a, an Iron Man theme to it because um, the Bry Forum presentation I did was called something like uh, Life on the Bleeding Edge or something like that, and very sort of tangentially, Iron Man has a Bleeding Edge armor set, that's what it's called, so I thought, why not stick an Iron Man theme in? So if you're not an Iron Man fan, I do apologize. 
apologise for the, um, the, the, the the huge slew of Iron Man sort of references and pictures in there. Um, as I um, said, uh, Andy said, I'm a CTA and an AppSense ACA. Um, on Twitter, I am AppSense Bigot, which is a bit of a bizarre moniker, which gets me some really weird and wonderful followers, including no less than Jenna Jameson, uh, the well-known um, American adult movie actress, is one of my followers on Twitter. Um, she must be very into uh, sort of Windows 10 and app virtualization and user virtualization and stuff like that so um, yes feel free to give me a follow so um, right I shall just um, a quick sort of fairly loose um, agenda that we've got here I'm going to talk briefly about why Windows 10 is on the radar for so many people um, we've already done um, three sort of Windows 10 migration stroke deployments so hopefully should have some relevant stuff to tell you about that briefly go over some of the bigger changes in Windows 10 and then start talking about the the sort of parts of the whole Windows 10 um, sort of um, subject that are probably most relevant um, what editions you would want to choose the whole servicing branches thing which is quite convoluted and um, probably the biggest sort of jump you're going to have to make in terms of how you adapt yourself ready for Windows 10 on nicely into some sort of considerations around migration and then conclusions stroke aways that we've got in there so hopefully they should all flow nice into each other um, the servicing branches and migration thing is a bit of a fuzzy area um, as many things are from so it may be possible that people can chip in and educate me about a few certain aspects of it or we may just have a, a debate about the, the confusion that often reigns when talking about Microsoft things. But um, the first major part is obviously why are we all kind of looking at Windows 10? Why is Windows and so many people's radars at the moment and kind of um, a bit sort of oddly enough one of the, the, the sort of main reasons that people are thinking uh, very seriously about Windows 10 is because of the, the sort of previous Windows versions that we had out there and if you cast your mind back to when we kind of left XP Windows as an operating system particularly in the enterprise was quite badly received for a number of reasons, um, hardware and driver incompatibilities and various changes under the hood that people kind of weren't prepared for. But um, then Windows 7 sort of came along and people perceived that as a, a much bigger improvement over Windows Vista. And so um, Windows 7 became, I mean, a, a very well adopted operating system. It's still very, very popular out there in the world today. And so then Microsoft's next movement was towards Windows 8 and uh, after that Windows 8.1 which also turned out of one customer that I've worked for that have actually deployed Windows 8 in the enterprise and it was the whole changes around the start screen and the, the, the touch optimization of the device and things like that, the, the actual fact that the start menu was missing, Windows 8 and Windows 8.1 also weren't particularly popular. So people kind of developed this perception that when they heard that Windows 10 was coming along, that Windows 10 would be to Windows 8 um, what Windows 7 was to Windows Vista in that you know, Microsoft would kind of learn the lessons from that and they would give us an operating system that was lovely and enterprise ready and going to be there for years and years and years. Um, I'm not entirely sure it's turned out quite like that with what we've got with Windows 10 but it also perpetuated a bit the, the, this kind of one bad one good myth about Microsoft's delivery of operating systems. I did actually work for a customer once whose um, strategy was actually to skip every intermediate Windows operating system release which was kind of born out of this sort of myth. But the point I'm trying to make is a lot of people are thinking about Windows 10 because they had this perception that Microsoft would learn what they learned from Windows 8 and 8.1 and build all of that into Windows 10. So that's the one of the, the, the first reasons that people became sort of uh, quite keen on getting the adoption of it as part of their ongoing strategy. Um, the next major driver that I hear is continuity of support that people have, and if we all sort of cast our minds back to Windows XP when it went out of support, I think it was in 2014, um, I probably should have sanity checked that, but um, I definitely had an article that was dated 2014 that dealt with the Windows XP end of support. Um, so 
as I said, it ended, and a lot of companies didn't manage their migration away from XP very well. They kind of sort of ummed and ahed a bit and, you know, sort of buried their heads in the sand in some cases, and they ended up basically having to get a lot of application remediation and testing done within quite a, a limited time frame, and they had to put a lot of resource towards that, a lot of time, and in some cases they ended up paying for extended support, which meant that it ended up costing them quite a lot of money. And so a lot of people have seen a repeat of this, and everybody's very aware that Windows 7, which is possibly the most dominant of the Windows operating systems out at the moment on top, so people are in to avoid a repeat of the, the sort of XP, Xpocalypse, or whatever you want to call it, that whole debacle that we had, really. And they want to start doing the... Um, you know, the, the, the testing and the remediation and the vendor engagement and everything that goes with it to ensure that this time they don't end up, you know, running a very quick panicked project to get everything on board to Windows 10. They definitely don't want to end up paying for extended support again or anything like that. So that's um, possibly really the, the biggest reason that I see cited by people about why they want to go get ahead and start planning for a migration to Windows 10. Well, actually, there is another reason that's coming up more and more these days when I talk to people about Windows 10, and uh, this is about security, and this is not um, a made-up statistic. This was done by Trend Micro. Apparently, one million new strains of malware are discovered every day, um, so, you know, I should have had a Dr. Evil picture in there, really, for one million new strains, but that is apparently... Um, um, exactly right, we're well, not exactly right, but that, that's the volume of malware that we're doing. And most of the malware that we see these days has moved away from sort of, you know, the, the days of the script kiddies just trying to shut down or upset as many users as possible. And a lot of the stuff you see these days is ransomware, which is a big concern. So yeah, I kind of had the original what you called, um, I can't remember, lock screen um, ransomware which basically told you, you know, that um, similar to this, you've been looking at pornography or zoophilia or anything like that, and um, they've locked your computer and you have to pay the fine or you will be arrested. And that was the kind of the original strain. That's probably more these days that we say the most, or obviously encryption mal. And a lot of people are very, very concerned about this. I mean, it needs um, administrative rights or privilege S on. When it executes, the user's files that they're going to access are encrypted, and you have to either pay a ransom in Bitcoin, or unless you've got, you know, good cold backups available that you can restore to, you're going to be left in a really um, nasty situation. Um, it's getting to the stage now. The FBI, um, a few months ago, actually um, went out and said people should consider actually just paying up um, and letting specific what people have got right now kind of ransomware insurance take care of this, which was probably not the most sensible thing for them to have uh, ever said, but apparently the San Francisco Metro is one I can think of off the top of my head that apparently just paired it up. And there is now actually rather bizarrely, I was reading today about a, a kind of third generation of ransomware called Bluff ransomware, which kind of made me lose all faith in humanity. Because apparently the way Bluff ransomware works is it just tells you your file encrypted, and they're not actually encrypted, and apparently uh, a certain percent pays pay up, which I find very hard to believe. But in this day and age, I never cease to be surprised at the things that some people will actually um, do. So anyway, it's kind of weird to be talking about Windows as a secure system because, um, as I can, remember the days of things like Blaster and Sasa and things like that, these self-propagating words that spread across the internet, um, you know, through lots of unpatched Windows devices. It's really odd to be talking about Windows from a security perspective and that, you know, Windows 10, particularly Windows 10 version 16 or 7, has some great security systems. We've got things like Secure Boot, which actually was introduced in Windows 8, but Windows 10, I think, takes it a bit further. Remove requirement for a manual sort of kill switch in there. We've got Credential Guard, which uses virtualization based security to isolate things like your NTLM password, hashes, and Kerberos tickets, which obviously reduces the potential for theft of these. 
Um, the main one that I have people discussing is device guard which restricts devices to running only signed code and apparently works even if your attacker has something itself. You can use device guards on, combine it with all the technology or AppSense application manager or something like that to achieve a, a really sort of really granular level of control of your execution security. There's all my window information protection. I think that needs to be combined with Intune or SC, but it allows you to provide data policy enforcement for documents and applications. We've obviously got encryption built in, sort of standard encryption that's been around a bit. But also pervasive encryption. I'm not entirely sure on the details of. I think that's just for users with Microsoft accounts. So it would be, you know, this sort of newer encryption extended to directory or even Azure Active Directory. Security is pretty much one also one of the big things. There's bits as well like Azure integration, we've got 365 and all this in tech along that. Well, the two biggest drivers that I do see when people clients are taught Windows 10 adoption in you know, or the continuity support and the security aspects and particularly anybody who's been hit by ransomware is usually mad keen on security. So I did a white paper recently about Windows 10 which I haven't actually published yet for a variety of reasons and um, I did a bit a few surveys in there of kind of EUC staff and everybody pretty much um, has some form of uh, movement towards Windows 10 on their radar. Um, 53% in the yellow there were in the process of planning to upgrade to Windows 10. 19% had begun testing, so putting test machines out, starting to validate applications, things like that. 17% had actually started the upgrade to Windows 10 from a production perspective. 2% said they'd completed their upgrade, so go them. Well done, those guys, for getting it done already. And 9% said they didn't have any plans to upgrade to Windows 10 at all. Um, I didn't go further into that. I probably should have. I didn't know whether they had other options, you know, such as adopting maybe something like Chromebooks with SaaS apps and to bury their head in the sand until the, you know, the, the deadline drew a bit closer and um, they started another panicky project. But it was quite good to say that uh, more than nine out of ten people essentially were in the process of planning or doing or having complete a Windows 10 upgrade. So that's um, pretty much shows us that everybody is keen to get Windows 10 and it's a part of their plans for the very near future. Uh, Windows 10 reduces a bunch of changes to stuff. Some of the ones that you may come across are listed here. You've got the whole universal Windows apps platform in there. Um, which is obviously something for a, a different um, part of this series. Start menu and the interface changes in there. User accounts and synchronization. There's a lot of Azure integration and things like OneDrive sitting there. But well, the biggest change, I think, from an IT perspective is the whole adoption of the sort of servicing model. That's going to make a big difference to how you've traditionally managed your environments compared to what you're going to have to adopt going forward with Windows 10. So, um, with that bit out of the way, we shall start talking about the, the sort of first question that you'll probably come across when you start thinking about Windows 10, which is the addition of Windows 10 that you're going to use and what sort of features you get with that. Uh, Windows 10 comes in eight editions. We have Home, we have Professional, we have Education, Enterprise, Mobile, Mobile Enterprise, IoT Core and IoT Core Pro. Um, I'm going to concentrate specifically on the first four of those, which are the desktop editions. Um, obviously, there is mobile and mobile enterprise, but iOS and Android are pretty dominant in the, the sort of mobile arena. Um, whenever I do say that and mention that I'm not going to concentrate on the, the mobile version, there's probably usually always a, a bunch of Windows Phone users out there that I've upset, so apologies to any who may be listening. And there's the whole IoT Core and IoT Core Pro, which I don't think is particularly relevant either. I mean, I thought Microsoft had got past this whole one OS to rule them all thing. 
um, things you know that don't really suit Windows, even cut down versions, and I don't think it's going to be particularly relevant in the enterprise anytime soon. Um, although you could end up with something like this, which is someone's trying to get a drink out of the water cooler and um, it's doing a Windows 10 upgrade, um, so you're just going to have to wait, um, die of thirst, or whatnot, or find another way of doing it. So yeah, I don't think that the IoT version of it is going to be. Um, taking off particularly much anytime soon, but I could be completely wrong. It will run on a Raspberry Pi now, so there's obviously a lot of scope out there to get it used. But anyway, concentrating on the desktop editions, just a quick sort of run through of some of the, the, the features that are in there. Um, the clue with um, the home edition, the, the clue is in the name, it really suits business usage very well. It lacks basic functionality such as domain join, group policy management and the like. So from an enterprise perspective, from a business perspective, you're obviously going to go down the route of professional education or enterprise. Uh, Windows 10 does have some interesting features. Uh, assigned access is one that I was particularly interested in because it lets you set up kind of like an internet chaos mode. Um, I thought that was very interesting till I found you could only run a modern app in the chaos mode and I did it, so not as great as I thought it possibly would be. Well, there's all sorts of stuff um, in there. You'll notice that professional few of features, but not so many of them. We've got a lot of tight Azure integration, such as joining Azure AD, add your user state roaming to Azure AD. I believe that feature is now called Enterprise State Roaming. But things like Device Guard, which aren't available on professional, with that things like Device Guard being one of the to those to it's quite possible that for the enterprise people, they're going to just make the, the choice between the education and enterprise editions. I think Microsoft have made a bit of an effort to dumb down the professional version a bit, possibly because it was given away for free as part of the free upgrade process. So they've recently started removing a few of the features from it, such as the ability to control start menu ads and remove some of the modern apps. So professionals probably not suited to any but uh, the smaller enterprise. So essentially, as an enterprise customer, you're getting pushed towards education. Or anything that's only available on the enterprise edition. And do you need access to long-term servicing branch for any machines, which is also only available in enterprise edition? If you can answer yes to any of these questions, then it's straightforward, use the Enterprise Edition. If the answer happened to be no to all of these, so if you're an academic institution who wasn't concerned about privacy and didn't need the long-term servicing branch, then you could use the Education Edition. But I did a deployment for a, a, a higher education institution and they went down the Enterprise route anyway because they were concerned about the privacy aspect of things. So nine times out of 10, Enterprise is the edition to choose. So that nice and simple, but it now brings us across to the horribly complicated part of Windows 10. I always hate um, these set of slides. Um, so talking about servicing branches. Servicing is a popular word these days. Citrix have adopted a, a similar process. But the first thing we need to do with regards to servicing branches is define some terminology. So on the first line there we have the kind of three classes of updates that you can get from Microsoft. We have feature upgrades, which Microsoft call the latest new features, capabilities, and experiences. Rather annoyingly, Microsoft are now referring as feature updates, possibly to disguise the fact that the feature upgrade or feature update, I'm going to call it a feature upgrade, um, are an entire copy of the Windows 10 operating system. So there's no more of this old way of um, sort of installing the operating system and then putting a service pack on to activate a feature. It's all completely self-contained. So the RTM version of Windows 10 was 10.0, Threshold 2 update 10.1, Redstone kind of like 10.2. So that's what a feature upgrade is. Servicing updates are what we've traditionally known as Hot fix, but they have kind of changed around a bit um, the way of deliver um, the way of delivering this now, because you now have uh, basically big cumulative updates. If you say this little part I've just brought in there, 
Um, it shows you the sizes of the updates from the bottom up of the 1511 cumulative updates, 48 meg to start with and over a gig by the time we were sort of 10 months down the line. Now from a perspective of, you know, if you want to re-image a machine, you only need to put one cumulative update on to get it up to date, near enough. But if you were doing um, sort of application testing or remediation, that also means if you discover an application issue, um, how would you find out which particular patch within this cumulative update caused the application issue? So it's a bit of a double-edged sword, that really. And I believe they're now pushing that to Windows 7 and Windows 8.1 machines as well. So that's what servicing updates are. But you also have what are known as definitions. Definitions are the Windows Defender updates and malicious software removal tool and things like that. So that's the three classes of updates that we can get within these servicing branches. Now next in the middle there, we have the, the way you can actually go and get these different classes of updates. You can connect directly to Windows Update, which means you connect directly to Microsoft's online update servers. You can use Windows Update for business um, if you're on professional or edition or above, which is kind of like a light version of WSUS. It doesn't bring down the updates onto the local network. It doesn't cache them, but it does have peering capability. So if one machine goes and downloads the updates, it can then serve them to peers on the same network. It also lets you split your machines up into some basic sort of um, deployment rings. You've got a fast ring and a slow ring. So that's what Windows Update for Business is. The kind of third option is WSUS or SCCM or any one of the third party patching tools that basically lets you, you know, download them onto a local server and maintain full granularity and control over all of the updates that you have out there. And that's the traditional method that people have used. And then you have your servicing branch, which controls kind of the, the method and timing of how these updates land on your machines, however where you go and fetch them. So we have four main branches. We have Windows Insider, we have Current Branch, CB, we have Current Branch for Business, CBB, and we have Long-Term Servicing Branch, which is LTSB. So each of these offers a, a, um, a different kind of method and timing for the provisioning of your feature upgrades and your definitions and your servicing updates. So I hope um, a Error with regard to um, um, there. Now the next point that I like to try, which is again very um, difficult, hand. How long actually is uh, not? to work unfortunately. You can tell straight away that the actual length of a servicing window is it's not really very clearly defined and I've tried to talk to people that might have cleared up but it's a bit like the license and that you get different and depending on who you talk to and what you read. Now Microsoft say that each feature upgrade will be supported for 18 time in a year to meet that equation, so I'm, I'm, I'm a bit confused really that how this is going to work going forward. So uh, I'd be lying I said I wasn't a little bit concerned about the, the fuzzy, but to, to get a sort of ballpark figure, what I've really had to do is go and say the current branch window, which is one servicing window, as we probably all know, is four to six months. Depending on that grace period, you might get an extra bit if you configure that particular JPO. Current branch for business obviously lets you defer, you run into that grace period, and whether you confer that particular um, group policy update. So that's the, the kind of period that we're looking at. Um, so the next bit is to kind of look at each servicing branch and what editions it's available on and how you can update these things. So 
The first branch we talked about was the Windows Insider branch, which is kind of almost like an alpha branch. Now, Windows Insider, I know I'm, I've been, uh, I have a tendency to be a bit nasty at Microsoft. Windows Insider is a great idea because if you remember um, when they released operating systems previously, basically um, you would get the technical preview maybe a few months before the actual RTM release came out, and you'd have to cram a lot of tests. Thing, um, into those three months. But now you get what are called flights of updates coming down on a regular basis. You can configure different speeds. You can be right on the bleeding edge. You can be just be. Well, this level gets up on one moment down the pipe upgrade version of. Uh, don't forget, fake to Windows 10, they also can be removed. So it's really you get your window users on. The window provider, probably technical ones are the best in case they have any issue. But you can get a head start on your testing on the training and it really gives a good head start much better than the way we had before. To get the updates directly from Windows and available on Windows 10. And right, which is considered a uh, so different size and really Microsoft are very keen that you consider them together with current branch almost as a pilot branch and current branch for business in the home edition, essentially the largest beta tester branch, to be fair. Business. They are the same operating system is simply that that deferral of that one servicing window is configured. So it's either a tick box in the settings app or it's an uh, Intune MDM or a group policy object turns a current branch machine into a current branch for business machine or vice versa. Um, so current branch for business is only available on pro education and enterprise as far as I uh, remember. Yes, that's right. And obviously current branch is available on all editions. All also, actually, correct. Sorry, I thought I'd made a mistake there. <laughs> they all support all three update mechanisms: Windows Update, Update for Business, and WSUS Stroke SCCM. There is the, the branch machines um, get get the release straight. And by the time that release makes it to the current branch for business branch, it has got three to four to six months, however long that servicing window is. It's got all of that testing and remediation done by all those poor current branch users out there, which will then ensure that it's more stable when it reaches the current branch for business bit. That's how it's actually intended to work. So I did say that current branch and current branch for business, you can use Windows Update, Windows Update for Business, or WSUS or SCCM. But which of these you choose defines the control that you get over your servicing updates and your definitions. So with all of these, you can defer the feature upgrades, but if you use Windows Update, you can't defer the servicing updates and definitions as far as I'm aware. You'll get all of those more or less straight away. Um, with Windows Update for Business, you can um, defer servicing updates by one calendar month and you can't defer definitions at all. So if you want complete control over um, how the servicing updates and the definitions land on your machines, you have to use WSUS or SCCM or another third party tool to enable that. So that's what you need to get that full control and granular of those updates and definitions. And then finally, we have the long term um, servicing branch. Uh, I can't. I couldn't find an answer as to whether you can run long-term servicing branch on Windows Update for Business. So that's why I've left it. Now, long-term servicing branch is only available on Enterprise, and you can update it via Windows Update or just slash it. It is a different operating system. You can go from current branch to current branch for business just by changing the things. If you were the current branch and then decide you want to switch back to the current branch for business. I'm not sure if you could actually roll off the, the branch that you were on at the minute. Long-term servicing branch is a completely different operating system. It's fairly stripped down. So if you want to go from long-term servicing branch back to current branch, you'd have to reinstall the operating system. I don't think that um, LTSV supports in place upgrades. Apparently there was an upgrade option in the 2015 version of LTSV, but apparently that was an error. 
But the main difference is that obviously it has that two to ten year servicing window, which allows it to be used outside of that current branch or current branch for business update schedule. Now, if you fall outside of your service, I'm not entirely sure the actual would be unsupported. So I heard from other people that you would actually get no more servicing updates. Either of those is not a particularly good situation to be in. And one final thing possibly worth mentioning is that Windows Server 2016, the desktop edition of that is is LTSB only. Um, the nano server is on the current branch, but Windows, the, the desktop edition, the traditional edition is LTSB only. So Microsoft um, possibly made a little bit of a backtrack to do with the, um, the, the server edition. Now the current branch, current branch for business model is, oh sorry that image is a bit blurry. Uh, um, must have been a bad screenshot, I apologize. Um, it's intended to slot straight into the servicing plans within SCCM. So kind of the current branch machines are referred to as release ready inside of um, SCCM and the current branch of business are described as business ready. So Microsoft kind of um, have this whole thing, this operating system readiness branch within SCCM. But then they're kind of almost expecting you to kind of integrate this kind of global patching model that they're sort of putting out to people. And that's quite interesting because I'm not sure how that would fit into certain industry verticals. Um, as I said, I did a deployment within higher education and they have very specific maintenance windows that tie in with student holidays and exam times and things like that. So I'm not sure that this kind of global patching model that they're pushing through SCCM would be particularly suitable for, um, you know, for every industry vertical out there. So, the, the big question around servicing branches really is if we take that kind of eight month servicing window, eight to twelve month, depending on Microsoft's vendor process, a development process rather, can your line of business application vendors provide you a fix to an issue that you discover within that eight to twelve month servicing window? So if the answer is yes, you would use current branch for business on those terms servicing branch. Now you can move between current branch for business and long term servicing branch. You're not committed to embracing one completely. You consider how your vendors are able to actually respond. I've seen vendors already really racing to get things fixed for particular releases of Windows going into the, the current branch for business model. Um, so you've got to make this decision. Microsoft are very keen to say long-term servicing branch is only for critical things like life support machines and air traffic control and things like that. It's not best worked with who consider regular desktops themselves to be mission critical, particularly where these are being used by employees that generate revenue streams. So a feature upgrade or a service upgrade that kills an application that's vital to these employees is going to be a big issue. So you know, I think Microsoft maybe need to think a bit more carefully about you know trying to make people feel like lepers if they if they use long-term servicing branch. But that's the question you've got to answer, and don't forget that that includes the time that you've got to factor in to test and discover the issue, and then push it back to engage with the vendor to get a fix from. So you've got that eight to twelve-month servicing window to get all of this done. So just to just to interrupt there, James, uh, Daniel had a had a question yeah. that possibly. They possibly have answered just with your talk about LTSB there. And his question was, if you own Zen Desktops LTSR, would you recommend going to LTSB? And I think from what you're saying there is take a view and judgment on the desktops that you've got in that LTSR, Zen Desktop environment. Yeah, I think it's... I think it's got to be about the applications, really, and I think that, um, as I'll get to a bit later, I think that, you know, separating the applications away from the underlying operating system is probably a very good idea from, you know, in terms of getting that. But, yeah, I think you've, you've got to do it dependent on the applications, really, on that particular device. So that's the, 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 the main thing. But obviously, uh, yeah, it's a, it, it is a bit of a really woolly error, unfortunately. Microsoft are very keen to kind of, as I say, make you feel like a second-class citizen. I had a bit of a, a bit of an interesting exchange on Twitter, you may have noticed, last week with somebody who kind of said you should never use long-term servicing branch. Microsoft have said you, should not, you shouldn't use long-term servicing branch on general-purpose machines. And their definition of a general-purpose machine was anything that runs Microsoft Office, which, again, I found to be um, kind of 
possibly quite naive from their perspective to just say if it runs Office, it's suitable to fit into the current branch of business, because that's not taking into account whether there are applications on there. Um, Oracle, um, in particular, um, I've found to take a very long time to fix any application issues that happen to be put their way. So if I had a big, you know, sort of vital Oracle product embedded in there, I'd certainly consider using long-term servicing branch just because I've, I've known them took well over a year to get back with a fix for something on there. So, um, yeah, it, as I said, it all really depends uh, on the applications. So hopefully that uh, answers that question. Uh, the point I made about Windows Insider, very vital to always get some test machines running Windows Insider. The main thing with that is, as I said, Microsoft don't just add new features, they also take them away. The RTM version of Windows 10 had a feature called Wi-Fi Sense, which kind of shared your saved Wi-Fi network works with all of your Outlook contacts or something crazy like that, which was a pretty rubbish feature. And when it was taken away in the 15 and 11 version, I thought, oh, well, that's great. But then I kind of thought, what if it wasn't a feature that I thought was rubbish and it was something that was actually quite useful to my users. So don't forget that you might find something users could depend on in Windows 10 is taken away in the, the next version that's coming down the pipeline. So getting that visibility and having this some sort of lead time to deal with it is the, the sort of great benefit you can get from having some people on that Windows Insider branch. I would also always, at the moment, use WSource SCCM or a similar patching tool unless you're a very small enterprise. I'm sure everybody's familiar with, you know, the, the, the sort of horrors that go with letting machines update themselves automatically and the, the potential for interruption that there is in there. If you go down that CB or CBB route, it is a fairly aggressive upgrade schedule. Microsoft have said they are committed to two or three releases per year and never being more than two releases um, sort of in, in service at any one time. So there may well be a very aggressive upgrade schedule and you may have to adapt your kind of approach to your whole delivery of your Windows estate if you know that becomes any more aggressive in future. Another quick point that I've learned the hard way is when you do one of these feature upgrades, always be very careful to re-verify all of your applied policies and configuration because Microsoft do have a habit of uh, renaming services and changing the registry keys that run GPOs in between these feature upgrades so it's important to do that as well. Uh, but the, the thing is we, we've got to adapt more moving very quickly now. We have the, the, the 1704 update, which is the creator's update, which is now on the horizon. So already I know that people who have just got to the 1607 version and they are already thinking, right, we need to get a hold of the creator's update and start doing testing on it and remediation and making sure everything works. And I'm not even going to go there about the rumors of some interface overhaul I've heard about Windows 10 called Project Neon, which are floating about on the internet there. So, yeah, that's the, the main sort of things that you need to get to grips with with servicing branches. Answer the question about the, the applications, how your vendors can fit into that servicing window, however long it may be, and define which branch you adopt from there. So if you do adopt this kind of CB, CBB model, you, you're kind of in a state of perpetual migration. As I said, you need to test applications, remediate the issues, prepare the deployment, do the deployment, do the mop-up, possibly once every year, which is something that we traditionally have done every three or four or five years, and now it's looking like every year. And I'm well aware of people who've actually replaced their support teams with delivery teams because the whole ongoing migration thing is really going to take over almost you know the, what support teams have traditionally done so migration also brings with it if you're on that current branch current branch for business model it brings you a very very big question which is possibly the biggest question about windows 10 do you do a wipe and reload, which is kind of the traditional way we've done it with operating system upgrades, particularly with VDI, or do you sit there and do an upgrade in place? Now, this is the, the one that really people are going to have to sit there and think about you know, how they're going to approach this. I did do a survey on this um, when I was doing some research for that white paper I mentioned, 
and it was a survey amongst hardened Windows veterans, and I think that may have slightly skewed the responses because 99.2% of them said they would do a wipe and reload, and only 08 actually entertained the thought of doing an in-place upgrade. Now, if you're talking VDI, I think possibly you might always do a wipe and reload. You might always start with a clean image, particularly not persistent. But if it's not a VDI environment that you're working with, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how people would approach this. Microsoft are quite determined that part one of the features of Windows is that this Windows 10 upgrade process, which is probably why they've now called it a feature update instead of a feature upgrade to disguise that fact. They want, they want it to be less intrusive. They want people to trust it. But this really depends on how they deal with any issues that crop up, you know, how radically they change the interface and, you know, basically how much mop-up people end up having to do. So, if you do an in-place upgrade, obviously it's much easier to manage, you know, you can just schedule a time out there and say, I want all my machines to do that um, upgrade at a particular point or stagger it, whatever you want. It obviously preserves all of your user data and applications, which means the user gets his upgrade done, he comes and logs on, it all looks, feels more or less the same as he left it, which is the kind of continuity that we like. You can control the delivery of this upgrade via Windows 10 servicing plans in SCCM or other technologies. However, on the con side, it can take a long time. Um, I used to have a Windows 10 laptop, I don't anymore, um, I have a Windows 7 one, but that's, um, that's nothing to do with Windows 10, and I remember it doing a feature upgrade once, and it took six hours, and I was very annoyed because I was in a hotel, and I had no other way of basically getting on the, on the internet and doing some work. Um, it can bring across kind of clutter, you know, that, that, that's within the underlying operating system, or incompatibilities, even security threats potentially, so sometimes it's... Um, from that perspective, it's better to go over with, a, with a, a clean slate. You can get instability. Applications might not work when you obviously do an OS upgrade and things may change underneath the hood, I mean, as you'd expect because it's a full OS upgrade. So that's the, the pros and cons for an in-place upgrade. Now, if you want to do a wipe and reload, um, it obviously requires a lot of planning and preparation because you're going to obviously reinstall the operating system. You then need to persist the user's access to applications and their data and their settings. You may need tools or scripts to, to get it to work, third-party tools possibly to enhance that whole um, sort of um, journey towards getting there. You obviously can control the same thing. Uh, through SCCM or the like, which is one of the, the pros of it. it. It is a lot quicker and it ensures that you've got a clean new copy of the operating system. I think it really depends on the selection you make on how reliable you think a Windows 10 in-place upgrade can be. If you end up mopping up 40% of your systems because those in-place upgrades fail or there's something wrong, you might as well have done a wipe and reload anyway, but if it's only 2% of an estate that fails, then an in-place upgrade will be much easier. But also there's the fact that systems fail anyway, regardless of the fact you know you're doing upgrades or the like. So in some cases it could be a good idea to have the, the capability to perform a rapid wipe and reload in the interests of keeping everything clean and tidy. Um, I did speak to someone recently who'd done a 1511 to 1607 in place upgrade and they gave me a fairly comprehensive rundown of where possible things that had gone wrong. The main one that they noticed was all the modern apps that they'd removed from their previous image all came back after they'd done the upgrade, which I'm sure they found rather annoying. I have put an asterisk next to that because Microsoft have said they recognise that this is a bit rubbish, really, and they are going to try and honour that in future, so they're working on changing that now, which is good because there's nothing worse than getting rid of Candy Crush and Farmville and World of Tanks, and it all just comes back after um, an in-place upgrade hits. They also found that the default user's language settings changed from English UK to English US, which was a bit annoying um, from terms of sort of um, keyboard layouts and things like that for users logging on for the first time. They did have a bunch of applications that had some issues and required reinstallation. Um, however, they were using a technology that made this not so much of a problem. Another of the interesting things was there's a large Windows.old folder left behind. It was about 15 gigabytes in this case, which, you know, Microsoft kind of think, well, you know, storage is cheap these days, but these guys had 128 gigabyte SSD system drives in there, so 15 gigabyte was a bit of a big deal for them. They also had some issues with the start menu breaking, which I'm not entirely sure what caused it yet, but there was a 
apparently they, they think the actual script they ran to get rid of the large windows.old folder somehow managed to change some permissions on user files as well which broke the start menu so I don't know whether that was specifically an issue caused by the upgrade or it was there trying to deal with an aspect of the upgrade they said the failure rate that they had to re I mean the, the, their approach was if any problems just re-image and they said that I do that on a 11% uh, so I'm not sure how much of a deal that kind of failure rate would be to you and that'll kind of define the choice I mean if you've got devices in lots of different locations and you haven't got much resources to do mop up and things like that those sort of things are going to drive the decision you make uh, my personal opinion at the moment and definitely where VDI obviously is concerned I'm on the side of let's do a clean build just to be sure this might change in time as we build trust in Windows 10 and the Microsoft upgrade process. It could also go completely the other way. Um, it's only going to take one big issue for everybody to just go running back to that whole mistrust thing. So if you do want to go down the wipe and reload route, it becomes, because you're going to be doing upgrades so much more regularly with Windows 10 if you're on that current branch model, you really need to find a way of persisting in that entire user personality that's out there and we've got kind of four main areas in there we've obviously got the users applications we've got the users data I've mentioned apps data bridge as kind of like file type associations because file type associations as I mentioned earlier on Windows 10 are a bit of a big deal but that's possibly something for another part of this and then you've got all the other stuff excuse me, that sits in the user profile like shortcuts and most recently used list and files like auto text and signatures and uh, taskbar items and all that sort of stuff. So if you go down that wipe and reload route or you do find yourself with a big failure, these are the things that you really want to be able to capture in order to sort of basically, you know, make sure a, a smooth user transition from upgrade to upgrade. Uh, just a quick survey there on how important these things are. Obviously, apps and data are the most important to have for the users and the, the sort of the supplementary settings and the FTAs and things like that, slightly less important. But traditionally, when we did migrations, people used things like, um, I did another survey here, I went to survey crazy recently, the Microsoft user state migration tool, other third party tools, some people did these things manually, some people wrote their own scripts. But a lot of these things have kind of overheads of maintenance associated with them. So I'm not entirely sure that it would be suitable to try and adapt these for a Windows 10 environment. So Microsoft um, have a stack of products that they kind of say, this is the way we'd, we'd manage this in, you know, in our ideal world. And it includes a whole host of stuff, possibly um, Azure as well. You've got UAV, which basically would you know, persist your user settings, OneDrive for your data, Intune for management, Office 365 as well. We've also got SCGM and the desktop bridge, which allows you to convert your applications into modern apps. And then you could use something like enterprise state roaming to save all of your user profile settings up there into Azure. I'm not entirely convinced that this model's ready yet for the enterprise as it stands. I mean, Azure asks a lot of questions to begin with, especially if you're in a, a sort of compliance um, area. OneDrive is awful, in my opinion. I am forced to use it at the moment, and I hate it with a passion. I'd much rather have ShareFile or something like that. Um, Office 365 is pretty good but has some issues of performance. Using the desktop bridge unless you're a developer is pretty non-trivial really and I think that's being nice. UEV is not really that feature rich. ASR needs a premium Azure AD only handles modern apps, things like that. So apart from SCCM um, and possibly Intune, there's not really a lot of this that I think is kind of like ready at this absolute moment to drive this kind of uh, Windows 10 constant migration tool set. So I think maybe you might need to look somewhat beyond Microsoft's stack at the moment. Now I mentioned the client that had said their application issues were avoided because they'd virtualized a whole host of their applications and I think virtualizing applications is a key part with Windows 10 because then you know it's one less thing to worry about once you do that operating system upgrade if the apps are kind of almost independent of the operating system 
you've got much less compatibility issues than if you had to natively install all of them as part of the task sequence or something like that. So there's all sorts of things you can use. AppV, um, Unidesk, which obviously I've now had to bang on the end, now part of Citrix, which I think is a really good play from Citrix. Um, FS Logics, App Disks is obviously now probably going to die. Unidesk will um, beat it to death and throw it out with the trash. We have app volumes, uh, Numescent, Turbo, Liquidware Flex app, Cloudhouse, things like that. So yeah, virtualizing your applications, whichever way you choose to do it, is really, you know, it takes a lot of the pain out of that sort of Windows 10 era. Um, Unidesk, obviously, um, um, this being the Citrix user group, I'm probably talking to a lot of Citrix people out there. Now that Unidesk is part of Citrix, um, that is really quite a compelling option for you to use for this application virtualization side of things. So if you can get all of those applications in there, packaged up, ready to slot into the operating system, be kind of detached from it, but integrated with it as well, then that puts you in a really good place with regards to this Windows 10 constant migration. Um, personally, I'm also a big fan of things like Numescent and Turbo and Cloudhouse as well, because they let you um, upload apps into Azure and stuff like that, but obviously, if you're a Citrix customer, um, I don't think really there's much um, need to look too far beyond Unidesk if you're looking to adapt something um, you know, for the application virtualization piece. With regards to data, um, folder redirection obviously helps a lot with data. If your users are, are the sort of users that put things where they're supposed to put them. Um, however, I've got one guy who likes to save all his stuff in his downloads folder, which obviously isn't in radar. Aid. Some maniacs use things like the recycle bin and stuff like that. And what you kind of get is a, a trade-off with folder redirection between storage capacity and data availability. You know, if you make users use those redirected areas, how do you stop them filling it full of their iTunes collection or pictures of their kids and things like that? But then, if you give them local areas, um, how do you handle it? You know, how do you how do you deal with the people who store data in weird areas? Um, rather weirdly, a product we found quite a bit of um, um, we've we've had quite a bit of success with is AppSense's Data Now product, um, which um, if you monitor the utilization and find out where those non-standard areas are, so find those weird places where your users are storing their data and. You can use AppSense Data Now, uh, which is kind of an, an, an enterprise file and sync tool, but you can actually basically, if you can feed in those non-standard areas, you can just capture them uh, via group policy objects. And then it kind of, when the user's getting ready for migration, it syncs them off in the background and then notifies that the user's ready for migration. So when they log back in, if say you've done a Windows 10, you know, wipe and reload to the latest version, it puts like little placeholders down on their machine that shows their files and then kind of synchronizes them back to those weird and wonderful areas in the background or on demand as required. So I found that's a really cool thing about AppSense data now. Um, I don't think the AppSense guys kind of really realized that much that they, they sort of had that cool sort of feature in there. But um, we had one particular place where everybody was using the, the D drive as a, as a scratch area. We basically synced all of that stuff off. So when they kind of did an upgrade on the machine, the D drive appeared, all that data appeared to be there. So it's quite a, a neat and useful tool. And hopefully I'll be doing a lot more stuff with that in future to get around some of the limitations of redirection. And the final piece that you'd need to persist really in this kind of wipe and reload situation is obviously the user's profile. And again, there's a lot of different ways you can manage this as well. You've got um, Microsoft's UAV product. Citrix obviously have user profile manager, which if you configure it correctly, um, will do the job on Windows 10 quite nicely. AppSense, VMware's UAM, Liquidware Labs, ResSense, FS Logics. You can also use Microsoft user profile disks for VDI only, apparently. That is now supported. Um, you do a bit of WMI to enable the user profile disks, and then you can you, you can use that in a Windows 10 VDI situation, which is quite cool, although Microsoft don't really seem to, to be too keen to develop it as a product. Obviously, you've got the, the kind of lower end stuff like FS Logics and UPD. If the Windows 10 upgrade increments the profile version like it did from a version 5 to a version 6 between 15.11 and 16.07, those will no longer work and you'll have to recreate the profiles. The higher end ones like AppSense, Res, Profile Unity, Sense can deal with that quite sort of um, quite sort of easily. So yeah, the roaming profile that you, you obviously get the option for with 
that comes with the Windows operating system in AD is not really suitable because there's so much of Windows 10's user profile stuff is now in the local app data folder that kind of makes the roaming profile no longer suitable for this. So you're going to have to adopt a, a UEM solution of some sort in order to enable this for your users in a Windows 10 wipe and reload situation. Uh, so, um, the takeaways from this, I love that slide. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's my desk. It's not really. Um, the takeaways that we've got really from this um, sort of bit: always use the Enterprise Edition um, unless you know you can fulfil the criteria for that application SKU. Always have test machines running those Windows Insider. This is a great idea. This Windows Insider flights get a lot of users on there ideally if you could you know cover all of the applications the major apps in your environment with Windows inside of people as well I know it's difficult sometimes to push it on to non techy users but if you can it would be great measure up your kind of vendor response time assess your applications and from there work out where you need to use current branch current branch of business and where you may need to use LTSB as I said you can mix and match you're not tied to any sort of exclusivity there at all Always use WSUS or SCCM because otherwise you're ceding some of the control over um, for the, the servicing updates and the definitions. The biggest question you need to ask yourself is, is it in-place upgrade or is it reload? You, I mean, you can change your mind about this. You could try the upgrade, see how it goes, and then go to the reload method. If you're VDI, then possibly creating a new image every time there's a feature upgrade might be a recommended way to go as well. Uh, virtualize as many of your non-core applications as you can. Um, that really takes some of the pain out of that. We have seen that in the real world. Our clients saying, yeah, we had a bunch of problems with the in-place upgrade, but because all of our non-core applications were virtualized it it wasn't as big a problem as it possibly could have been you know um, if you need that true smooth roaming as well whether you're in a non-persistent environment or you know you, you go in the wipe and reload route you will excuse me need to use some form of user environment management solution to do that roaming and if you're going to you know adopt this aggressive update cadence that comes with the current branch for business then there are a bunch of tools out there that can help you speed up that migration and avoid having to do all that horrible mop up that's out there you know and I think that's another important thing to do is to when you do a, a feature upgrade to always have the metrics available to do the monitoring to say exactly how many you've failed how much mop up do I have to do how much resource and time is this costing me and how can I then adapt my approach in future to make sure that I'm minimizing the workload that's caused by this rolling upgrade kids. Um, so should you deploy Windows 10? <laughs> um, uh, kind of uh, sort of um, it's a big jump with all of the servicing stuff out there and you know this constant migration process it kind of puts you at a crossroads Maybe you could sit here and say with Windows 10, am I still wedded to Windows apps? Um, I do know a couple of people who've said we do all SaaS based stuff when we use Google apps. But I think most enterprises out there still have some sort of dependency on Windows applications. So I think it's possibly a case of when, not if, you will end up deploying Windows 10. I don't think Microsoft are really in that much danger of reaching a tipping point away from Windows just this moment. But the main thing is that this rapid release cycle, if it does get any shorter or more aggressive, I can see, you know, IT departments getting stuck in frantic evaluation and testing cycles and kind of admins harking back to Patch Tuesdays with fond memories. So it's very important to consider what sort of an impact that's going to have on the day-to-day -day running of your IT department. So whether you need to throw more resources at it or whether you need to try and adopt a bunch of tools that can help you take some of the pain out of that is a very important thing to do. And of course, there's uh, very much the, the big elephant in the room. Microsoft, I think, have Azure on the, the horizon, as it were, to say to you, you know, and especially with the way that the, the partnership with Citrix is going now, to say that, you know, maybe it's a reality that we're going to be able to deploy your Windows 10 desktops from the cloud and you can scale out wherever necessary, burst out to the cloud and deploy more desktops. So they might end up locking you into a nice big 
azure coffin there that's just me with my cynical head on so um i said we've overrun slightly my apologies for that so um are there any questions or commentary that we have out there there's been some nice comments on the content we, uh, thanks very much for that sean i think one thing that came out was early on you were talking about um your white paper um, which yes, hopefully will be out soon because uh, a couple of people have been asking when that would be released, and then a few other people were obviously you. You put in a number of graphs there from dedicated surveys, yes. and they were just wondering how you did that surveying, and I, I was under the, the impression that you just asked people some questions rather than uh, a massive exercise. But yeah, I did some of it on Twitter. I did some of it on um, a mailing list that I'm a part of. I also published a, a Survey Monkey one out on LinkedIn and Twitter as well. So that's where I got the up there. So obviously, though, you know, kind of um, social media kind of drives people into like-minded <laughs> other people. Well, that's true. So Not entirely fake news. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that every that there are a lot of cynical people <laughs> within most of those responses from a from a Windows veteran point of view. But yeah, it was mainly done social media and on a mailing list that I'm also part of as well. Cool. Um, then Drew's asking when this will recording be available soon. Um, it's been recorded, so uh, I think it gets put through post. Um, and then uploaded. I'd, I'd say within a couple of days, uh, and hopefully Stephanie's not listening and I've committed it to a thing but soon soon <laughs> Drew soon before the next Star Wars film definitely not a problem so if we I think if we've got any no more questions obviously if you needed to maybe if you're listening to this in the future and you have a question I'm sure James will be more than happy to answer uh, any questions that you've got via his Twitter handle of absence bigots wouldn't mind if you drop yep. past his uh, blog, which is now in a different location. It's on, not on your old site, it's on a new site. What was the link to that again? Um, it still redirects from oh. absentsbigot.blogspot.co.uk, but it's also um, htguk.com slash blog. Cool. Uh, we'll try and uh, coerce or cajole James into writing some of this up on my CUGC. Obviously engage with your my CUGC uh, local sessions if you've got one or even maybe put one together if you haven't. Um, hopefully if you found this useful, if you have then by all means get it in touch uh, and hope to see you again for future parts. Um, this has been part one in, in hopefully a series of at least two or three sessions. Cool, thank you very cool. much. Thank you James, thanks everyone. Um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much.